Mein Führer, the Russian forces are both capable and enormous. It is my duty to make that absolutely clear. It is also my duty to tell you that I cannot guarantee that the attack can be repelled. Fate, fate and strong belief in success will make up for all these insufficiencies. I tell you, Colonel General, if you are conscious of the fact that this battle should be won, it will be won. The forces I have presented are, for the most part, fighters. They're the best of the best. And they are the troops who are at Mont Cassino. Troops whose fame outshone all others. These men have the will, the courage, and certainly the experience. Heinrichsi at the Führerbunker, 5th of April, 1945. Deciding strategy against the Soviets on the Oder. Even as Zhukov and Konev began feverishly preparing to hurl 13 armies with more than a million men at Berlin, Hitler had another of his famous intuitions. The gathering of the Russian armies at Kustrin, directly opposite the capital, was nothing more than a mighty feint, he concluded. The main Soviet offensive would be aimed at Prague in the south, not at Berlin. Ferdinand Schorner, the commander of Army Group Center, was the only one of Hitler's generals that shared this opinion. He was amongst the least talented, but he was a favorite of the Führer and was therefore promptly promoted to Field Marshal. At the same time, Hitler issued a fateful directive. On April 5, he ordered the transfer south of four of Heinrichsi's veteran panzer units the very forces the new commander Army Group Vistilla had been depending on to blunt the Russian drive. The same day at 3 p.m., Heinrichsi was to attend a memorable conference at the Führer Bunker in Berlin. As we saw in the last episode, the bitter assignment of who was to hold the Soviets on the Oder and save Berlin fell on Heinrichsi, a man largely unknown in popular culture. Let's have a closer look on the man who just became the most important German officer in this last major battle of the war. Colonel General Gotthard Heinrichsi, 58, was a seasoned officer. He was the cousin of Marshal Gerd von Ornstedt and was considered, along with Marshal Model, one of the Wehrmacht's masters of defense. He was also seen as an atypic Wehrmacht officer and his career records confirm this. Few German generals had experienced more of the war and conversely, few of such high rank had achieved less prominence. He was no dashing Rommel, praised for his successes and honored with a field marshal's baton. No, outside of battle orders, Heinrichsi's name had scarcely appeared in print. The fame and glory that every soldier seeks had eluded him. His specialty was defence, and in that he had few peers. A thoughtful and precise strategist, a deceptively mild-mannered commander, Heinrichsi was, nevertheless, a tough general of the old aristocratic school, who had long ago learned to hold the line with the minimum of men and at the lowest possible cost. Heinrichsi hated the highly polished knee-high jackboot so popular with German officers. He preferred ordinary low-cut boots, worn with the old-fashioned World War I leather leggings that buckled at the side. As for his overcoats, he liked his ratty sheepskin coat and refused to part with it, despite the advice he received from fellow officers. He wore his uniforms until they were threadbare. But if Heinrichsi did not look the part of a general, he did act like one. He was every inch the soldier and to the troops he commanded, particularly after his stand at Moscow, he was a legendary one. In December 1941, the German armies were thrown back with staggering losses from the gates of Moscow, and for a time it seemed as if the terrible retreat of Napoleon's armies in 1812 would be repeated on an even greater and bloodier scale. 
the line had to be stabilised and it was Heinrichsi who was given the toughest sector to hold. On January 26, 1942, he was placed in command of the remnants of the 4th Army, which was the linchpin of the German line, holding the ground directly facing Moscow. Any major withdrawal on its part would jeopardise the armies on either flank and might trigger a rout. Heinrichsi then developed a technique that made him famous. When he knew a Russian attack was coming in a particular sector, he would order his troops to retreat the night before to new positions one or two miles back. The Russian artillery barrage would land on a deserted front line. As Heinrichsi himself put it, it was like hitting an empty bag. The Russian attack would lose its speed because my men, unharmed, would be ready. Then my troops on sectors that had not been attacked would close in and reoccupy the original front lines. The trick was to know when the Russians were preparing for an attack. From intelligence reports, patrols and the interrogation of prisoners, plus an extraordinary sixth sense, Heinrichsi was able to pinpoint the time and place with almost mathematical precision. It was not always possible to employ these methods, but when he did, Heinrichsi had to use great caution. Hitler had punished other generals for defying his no-withdrawal order. For obvious reasons, Heinrichsi had never been a favourite of Hitler, or his court. His aristocratic and conservative military background demanded that he faithfully observe the oath of allegiance to Hitler, but the call of a higher dictatorship had always come first. Early in the war, Heinrichsi had fallen afoul of the Führer because of his religious views. Heinrichsi, who had never been a member of the Nazi party, was informed that the Führer considers your religious activities incompatible with the aims of National Socialism. Stonily, Heinrichsi listened to the warning. The following Sunday, he, his wife, son and daughter, attended church as usual. Thereafter, he was promoted slowly and reluctantly. Promotion might have been denied him entirely except for his undeniably brilliant leadership and the fact that the various commanders under whom he served kept insisting on his promotion. Late in 1943, Heinrichsi incurred the enmity of Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, once again on religious grounds. Göring vehemently complained to Hitler that during the retreat of the Fourth Army in Russia, Heinrichsi had failed to carry out the Führer's scorched earth policy. Specifically, he charged that the general had deliberately defied the orders to burn and lay waste every habitable building in Smolensk. Among other buildings left standing had been the town's great cathedral. Heinrichsi explained solemnly that, had Smolensk been fired, I could not have withdrawn my forces through it. As Colonel General Heinrichsi arrived with his adjutant, Colonel Eismann, he could only make a guess as to the size and depth of the bunker. From what he could see, it appeared relatively spacious, with doors leading to rooms on either side of the corridor lounge and beyond. Because of its low ceiling, narrow metal doors and the absence of windows, this might have been the passageway in a small ocean liner, except that they were at least 40 feet below ground. A tall, elegantly dressed SS officer appeared. This was Hitler's personal aide and bodyguard, Colonel Guncher. Hitler's adjutant, General Bergdorf, came next. Then came Field Marshal Keitel, the OKW Chief of Staff, followed by Himmler, Admiral Dönitz, and the man reputed to be Hitler's closest confidant, Martin Bormann. All greeted the newcomers loudly. Heinrichsi's posture, stiff, serious and measured, made him look like a real soldier, surrounded by court whose only goal was to gain importance in Hitler's eyes. Heinrichsi tensed as Himmler walked across the room toward him. In an undertone, the general growled to his adjutant, That man is never going to set foot in mine headquarters. If he ever announces a visit, tell me quickly so I can leave. He makes me sick. And indeed, Heinrichsi looked pale as Himmler dragged him into conversation. At that moment, General Krebs, Guderian's successor at the OKH General Staff, came into the room and seeing Heinrichsi came across to him immediately. Earlier in the day, the commander of Army Group Vistula had learned of the transfer of his vital armoured units to Schroener's Army Group. 
even as he blamed Krebs for not vigorously protesting the decision. Heinrichi now seemed almost cordial to the new chief of the army. At least he did not have to continue talking to Himmler. Krebs, as usual, was diplomatic and solicitous. He had no doubt that everything would work out all right at the conference, he assured Heinrichi. Dönitz, Keitel and Bormann now joined them and listened as Heinrichi mentioned some of his problems. All three promised their support when Heinrichi made his presentation to Hitler. Bormann then turned to Eismann and asked, What's your opinion about the army group situation? With Soviet troops only 38 miles from the capital and the Allies racing across Germany from the west, the question seemed to border on madness. Eismann replied bluntly, The situation is serious. That's why we're here. Bormann patted him smoothingly on the shoulder. You shouldn't worry so much. The Fuhrer is sure to grant you help. You'll get all the forces you need. Eismann stared. Where did Bormann think the forces were to come from? For a moment he had the uncomfortable feeling that he and Heinrichsi were the only sane people in the room. More and more officers and staff were filing into the already crowded corridor. Among them were Hitler's operations chief, General Jodl, the Luftwaffe's chief of staff, General Kohler, and the OKW's staff chief in charge of supplies and reinforcements, General Bula. Nearly every man seemed to be followed by an aide, an orderly or a deputy. The resulting noise and confusion reminded Eismann of a swarm of bees. In the packed corridor, Heinrichi now stood silent, listening impassively to the din of conversation. For the most part, it consisted of small talk, trivial and irrelevant. The bunker seemed unreal. The experienced general had the disquieting feeling that the men around Hitler had retreated into a dream world in which they had convinced themselves that by some miracle a catastrophe could be averted. Now as they waited for the man who, they believed, would produce this miracle, there was a sudden movement in the corridor. General Bergdorf, hands high above his head, waving the group into silence. Gentlemen, gentlemen, he said, the Führer is coming. He came shuffling into the bunker corridor, half bent, dragging his left foot, the left arm shaking uncontrollably. He looked much smaller than he was. The eyes that admirers had called magnetic were feverish and red. A pair of pale green spectacles dangled from his right hand, because bright light bothered him now. For a moment he gazed expressionlessly at his generals as their hands shot up into a resounding Heil Hitler. The corridor was so crowded that Hitler had some difficulty getting past everyone to reach the small conference room. Eismann noticed that the others began talking as soon as the Führer passed. There was not the respectful silence he had expected. Heinrichsi was surprised by the Führer's pitiful appearance. Slowly Hitler shuffled to his place at the head of the table. To Eismann's surprise he seemed to crumple like a sack into the armchair, not uttering a word, and held that prostrate condition, his arms propped up on the sides of the chair. Krebs and Bormann moved in behind the Führer to sit on a bench against the wall. Keitel, Himmler and Dönitz took chairs on the opposite side of the table. Krebs began the conference, looking first at Heinrichsi and said, in order that the commander can get back to his army group as soon as possible, I propose that he give his report immediately. Hitler nodded, put on his green glasses, and gestured to Heinrichsi to begin. In his measured and precise manner, the general got straight to the point, looking directly at each man around the table. Then at Hitler he said, Mein Führer, I must tell you that the enemy is preparing an attack of unusual strength and unusual force. At this moment they are preparing in these areas, in south of Schwedt, to the south of Frankfurt. On Hitler's own map, lying on the table, Heinrichsi slowly ran his finger down the threatened section of the Oderfront, a line roughly 75 miles long, touching briefly on the cities where he expected the heaviest blows. At Schwedt, in the Vritzen area, around the Küstrin bridgehead, and south of Frankfurt, he said, the main attack will hit Bussel's Ninth Army, and it will strike the southern flank of von Musel's third Panzer Army around Schwedt. 
Carefully Heinrichsy described how he had juggled his forces to build up Bus's Ninth Army against the expected Russian onslaught. But because of this need to strengthen Busser, von Manteuffel had suffered. Part of the 3rd Panzer Army front was now being held by inferior troops. Aged home guardsmen, a few Hungarian units, and some divisions of Russian defectors under General Andrei Vlasov. Well, the 9th Army is now in better shape than it was. The 3rd Panzer Army is in no state to fight at all. The potential of von Musevilla's troops, at least in the middle northern sectors of his front, is low. They have no artillery whatsoever. Anti-aircraft guns cannot replace artillery, and, in any case, there is insufficient ammunition, even for this. Krebs hastily interrupted. The 3rd Panzer Army will receive artillery shortly. Heinrichsy inclined his head, but made no comment. He would believe Krebs when he actually saw the guns. Continuing as though there had been no interruption, he explained to Hitler that the 3rd Panzer owed its present safe situation to one thing only, the flooded order. I must warn you that we can accept the 3rd Panzer's weak conditions only as long as the order remains flooded. Once the waters drop, the Russians will not fail to attack there too. The men in the room listened attentively, if a little uneasily, to Heinrich's presentation. Such directness at a Hitler conference was unusual. Most officers presented the gains and skipped the drawbacks. Not since Guderian's departure had anyone spoken so frankly, and it was clear that Heinrichsy was only beginning. Now he turned to the matter of the garrison holding out at Frankfurt on Oder. Hitler had declared the city a fortress like the ill-fated Kustrin. Heinrichsy wanted Frankfurt abandoned. He felt the troops there were being sacrificed on the altar of Hitler's fortress mania. They could be saved and used to advantage elsewhere. Guderian, who had shared the same opinion regarding Kustrin, had been broken for his views about that city. Heinrichsy might meet the same fate for his opposition now. But the Vistula commander saw the men of Frankfurt as his responsibility. Whatever the consequences, he was not to be intimidated. He raised the issue. In the Ninth Army sector, one of the weakest parts of the front is around Frankfurt. The garrison strength is very low, as is their ammunition. I believe we should abandon their defense at Frankfurt and bring the troops out. Suddenly Hitler looked up and uttered his first words since the meeting began. He said harshly, I refuse to accept this. Up to this point, Hitler had sat not only silent, but unmoving as though completely disinterested. Eisman had had the impression that he wasn't even listening. Now the Führer suddenly came awake and began to take an intense interest. He began asking about the garrison's strength, supplies and ammunition, and even, for some incomprehensible reason, about the deployment of Frankfurt's artillery. Heinrichsy had the answers. Step by step he built his case, taking reports and statistics from Eisman and placing them on the table before the Führer. Hitler looked at the papers as each was handed over and seemed impressed. Sensing his opportunity, Heinrichsy said quietly but emphatically, Mein Führer, I honestly feel that giving up the defense of Frankenfurt would be a wise and sound move. To the astonishment of most of those in the room, Hitler, turning to the chief of OKH, said, Krebs, I believe the general's opinion on Frankfurt is sound. Make out the necessary orders for the army group and give them to me today. In the stunned silence that followed, the babble of voices in the corridor outside seemed unduly loud. Eisman sensed a sudden and new respect for Heinrichsy. Heinrichsy himself seemed completely unmoved, he remembered. But he gave me a look which I interpreted as, well, we've won. At that moment there was a loud commotion in the corridor and the vast bulk of Reichsmarschall Göring filled the doorway of the little conference room. Pushing his way in, Göring loudly greeted those present, took Hitler's hand vigorously, and excused himself for being late. He squeezed in next to Donitz, and there was an uncomfortable delay while Krebs brought him quickly up to date on Heinrichsy's briefing. When Krebs had finished, Göring got up and placed both hands on the map table, leaned toward Hitler, as though to make some comment on the proceedings. Instead, smiling widely and with obvious good humour, he said, I must tell you a story about one of my visits to the 9th Parachute Division. He got no further. 
Hitler sat suddenly bolt upright in his chair and then jerked himself to his feet. Words poured from his mouth in such a torrent that those present could scarcely understand him. Before our eyes, recalled Eisman, he went into a volcanic rage. His fury had nothing to do with Goering. It was a diatribe against his advisers and generals for deliberately refusing to understand him on the tactical use of forts. He yelled, Again and again, forts have fulfilled their purpose throughout the war. This was proven at Posen and Breslau. How many Russians were pinned down by them? And how difficult they were to capture? Every one of those forts was held to the very last man. History has proved me right, and my order to defend a fort to the last man is right. That's why Frankfurt is to retain its status as a fort. As suddenly as it had begun, the tirade ended. But Hitler, though slack with exhaustion, could no longer sit still. Despite Hitler's choleric outburst, and despite his mercurial change of mind about Frankfurt, Heinrichsi doggedly refused to give up. Quietly, patiently, almost as though the outburst had not occurred. He went over all the arguments again, underlining every conceivable reason for abandoning Frankfurt. Dönitz, Himmler and Göring supported him, but it was token support at best. The three most powerful generals in the room remained silent. Keitel and Jodl said nothing, and just as Heinrichsi had expected, Krebs offered no opinion one way or the other. Hitler, apparently spent, only made tired gestures with his hands as he dismissed each argument. Then, with renewed vitality, he demanded to know the credentials of the commander of the Frankfurt garrison, Colonel Bieler. Heinrichsi replied, He is a very reliable and experienced officer who has proven himself time and time again in battle. Is he a Gneiser now? snapped Hitler referring to General Graf von Neisenau, who had successfully defended the fortress of Kolberg against Napoleon in 1806. Heinrichsi kept his composure. The battle for Frankfurt will prove whether he is a noose now or not. All right. Send Bieler to see me tomorrow so that I can judge him. Then I shall decide what's to be done about Frankfurt. Mein Führer, I do not believe the forces of the Otter Front will be able to resist the extremely heavy Russian attacks which will be made upon them. Hitler, still trembling, was silent. Heinrichi described the state of the troops. Most units in the line were untrained, inexperienced, or so watered down by green reinforcements as to be unreliable. The same was true of many of the commanders. For example, the 9th Parachute Division worries me. Its commanders and non-commissioned officers are nearly all former administration officers, both untrained and unaccustomed to lead fighting units. Goering suddenly bristled. He said in a loud voice, My paratroopers. You're talking about my paratroopers. They're the best in existence and I won't listen to such degrading remarks. I personally guarantee their fighting capabilities. You're few. Herr Reichsmarschall, is somewhat biased. I'm not saying anything against your troops, but experience has taught me that untrained units, especially those led by green officers, are often so terribly shaken by their first exposure to artillery bombardment that they are not much good for anything thereafter. Hitler spoke again, his voice now calm and rational. Everything must be done to train these formations. There is certainly time to do this before the battle. Training will not give them fighting experience, and that is what's lacking. The right commanders will provide the experience, and anyway, the Russians are fighting with substandard troops too. Stalin is nearing the end of his strength, and about all he has left are slave soldiers whose capabilities are extremely limited. The time to hammer home the truths of the desperate situation had arrived. Heinrichsi said bluntly, Mein Führer, the Russian forces are both capable and enormous. I must tell you that since the transfer of the armored units to Schorner, all my troops, good and bad, must be used as frontline troops. There are no reserves. None. Will they resist the heavy shelling preceding the attack? Will they withstand the initial impact? For a time, perhaps yes. But 
against the kind of attack we expect. Every one of our divisions will lose a battalion a day. This means that all along the battlefront, we will lose divisions themselves at this rate at once per week. We cannot sustain such losses. We have nothing to replace them with. Mein Führer, at best, we can hold out for just a few days. Then it must all come to an end. There was dead silence. Heinrichsi knew that his figures were indisputable. The men gathered there were as familiar with casualty statistics as he. The difference was that they would not have spoken of them. Goering was the first to break the deafening silence. My Führer, I will place immediately at your disposal 100,000 Luftwaffe men. They will report to the Oder Front in a few days. Himmler glanced at Goering, his main rival, then at Hitler, as if sampling the Führer's reaction. Then he too made an announcement. My Führer, the SS has the honor to furnish 25,000 fighters for the Oder Front. Dönitz was not to be outdone. He declared, My Führer, 12,000 sailors will be released immediately from their ships and rushed to the Oder. Heinrich stared at them. They were volunteering, untrained, unequipped, unqualified forces from their own private empires. Spending men instead of money in a sport of ghastly auction. They were bidding against one another, not to save Germany, but to impress Hitler. And suddenly the auction fever became contagious. Voices sounded as each man tried to suggest other forces that might be available. Someone asked for the reserve army figures and Hitler called out for Major General Buller, staff chief in charge of supplies and reinforcements. As he entered the conference room, Heinrichsi looked at him and then away in disgust. Buller had obviously been drinking. Nobody else seemed to notice or care, including Hitler, who put a number of questions to him about reserves, supplies of rifles, small arms and ammunition. Buller answered thickly and Heinrichsi thought stupidly but the answers seemed to satisfy Hitler. According to him, another 13,000 troops could be scraped together from the so-called reserve army. Dismissing Buller, Hitler turned to Heinrichsi. There, you have 150,000 men, about 12 divisions. There are your reserves. The auction was over. Hitler apparently considered the army group's problems settled. It all he had done was to buy, at most, 12 more days for the Third Reich and probably at a tremendous cost. Heinrichsi struggled to preserve his control. These men are not trained. They have been in rear areas and in offices or on ships, in maintenance work at Luftlaff bases. They have never fought as a front. They have never seen a Russian. Gooding cut in. The forces I have presented are, for the most part, fighters. They are the best of the best. And they are the troops who are at Mont Cassino, troops whose fame outshone all others. These men have the will, the courage, and certainly the experience. Dönitz too was angry. I tell you, the crews of warships are as good as your Wehrmacht troops. For just a moment, Heinrichsi himself flared. Don't you think there's a big difference between fighting at sea and fighting on land? I tell you. All these men will be slaughtered at the front. Slaughtered! If Heinrichsi's sudden outburst moved Hitler, he did not show it. As the others fumed, he seemed to have grown icily calm. All right. We will place these reserve troops in the second line, about eight kilometers behind the first. The front line will absorb the brunt of the Russian preparatory artillery fire. Meanwhile, the reserves will grow accustomed to battle. And if the Russians break through, they will then fight. To throw back the Russians if they break through, you have to use the panzer divisions. And he gazed at Heinrichsi, as though awaiting agreement on what was really a very simple matter. Heinrichsi did not find it so. You have taken away my most experienced armored units. The army group has made a request for their return. I must have them back! There was a movement behind him and Hitler's adjutant Bergdorf whispered angrily in Heinrichsi's ear. Finish. You must finish this. But Heinrichsi stood his ground, ignoring Bergdorf. He repeated, My Führer, I must have those armored units back. Hitler waved his hand, almost apologetically. 
I am very sorry, but I had to take them from you. Your panzers are needed much more by your southern neighbor. The main attack of the Russians is clearly not aimed at Berlin. There is a stronger concentration of enemy forces to the south of your front in Saxony. All of this is merely a support attack in order to confuse. The main thrust of the enemy will not be directed at Berlin, but there, at Prague. Consequently, the army group Vistula should be well able to withstand the secondary attacks. Heinrichsi stared unbelievingly at Hitler. Then he looked at Krebs. Certainly, all this must seem equally irrational to the chief of OKH, but it did not. Heinrichsi had done all he could. He thought it was now time to conclude this unreal conversation. My Führer, I have completed everything possible to prepare for the attack. I cannot consider these 150,000 men as reserves. I also cannot do anything about the terrible losses we must surely sustain. It is my duty to make that absolutely clear. It is also my duty to tell you that I cannot guarantee that the attack can be repelled. At these words, Hitler was like one suddenly awakened. Struggling to his feet, he hit the table and yelled, Fate! Fate and strong belief in success will make up for all these insufficiencies! Every commander must be filled with confidence! You! You must radiate this fate! You must instill this belief in your troops! Mein Führer, I must repeat that hope and faith alone will not win this battle. I tell you, Colonel General, if you are conscious of the fact that this battle should be won, it will be won! If your troops are given the same belief, then you will achieve victory and the greatest success of the war! In the tense silence which followed, Heinrichsi, white-faced, gathered his papers and handed them to Eismann. The two officers took their leave. They climbed the stairs and went out into the garden. There, for the first time since he left the conference room, Heinrichsi spoke wearily. It's all of no use. You might just as well try to bring the moon down to the earth. It's all for nothing. All for nothing.